my sound. It's my sound. It's our sound. Yes. How there about is that? no we in audio. <laughs> <laughs> but there is an I and a you. <laughs> oh, God. And an <laughs> I. I. And an A. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Hi, Dominic. Hi, Kate. How are you on this special day? I am very good. Excellent. And why a special day? Because I took a day off work for illness. <laughs> <laughs> and I decided to come in for my birthday. Yay! Happy birthday, Dominic. So while we're recording this, it's Monday the 15th, which is Dominic's birthday. And you will hear this on the Friday. So he would have had a whole week of partying. Have you had the bestest day? I've had a really interesting day, Kate. I have a, a tale to tell. A little I want to hear a story. Amazing. I want to hear it. <laughs> so I'm turning 36 today and I thought, you know what? Maybe I should do something to make myself feel good about myself. Mm. Natural, right? Yeah, of course. On your um, birthday, treat yourself. And when, when you get to a certain age, you know, look, my hair's starting to thin, so I've been contemplating, do I do something about my hair? Do I, you know, do I get on some sort of hair Advanced growing hair, treatment? Yeah, yeah. All that kind of crap. And then I'm like, oh, you know, the wrinkles too and, gym, you know, but I can't afford to do it all. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to go treat myself to a consultation with a cosmetic surgeon today just to, you know, just see what options are there. Perfect. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> so on my lunch break today I went to visit a friend of a friend so a doctor friend recommended this lovely lady named Dr Nikki and she okay. has a clinic in the city called Dr Fresh thanks for sponsoring us excellent thanks Dr Fresh we love that I love thank you for sending me three bars of Botox I don't know how to do it but I'll figure it out oh god yes now there's a horror <laughs> you story imagine? in itself <laughs> And I just, I had my consultation, I sat down and within five minutes, she's just like, okay, are you ready to get started? And I'm like, what? I, what? What are we doing? To do what? She, she's like, well, you, you've, you, I've talked you through all your options and, and here's my recommendations for you and your beautiful face. She gave me nothing but glowing, you know, feedback. Okay. But she's like, you've got a little crease just in between your brow and, you know, that's the thing that's going to eventually develop over the time. So before I knew it, I had needles in my forehead and I had Botox for the first time today. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, congratulations. Do you know what? The whole time you were telling that story, I may or may not have just been like staring at your forehead to just try to figure out if you'd gone. Under. But I can never tell because you do have a very useful face. So I wouldn't have been able to tell. That's brilliant. How was it? Tell me the goss. I'm contemplating. I've got a deep one in my forehead. So how was it? It was fine. I just didn't expect it to of course. happen, you know, today on the day. Like, I'm open to anything and I could care less. Like, you know, ultimately I'd love, like, big fish lips and <laughs> everything. You'd rock a fish lip. I love it. But um, it was just so – she was so sweet and lovely and very clear and she gave me – you know, she could have upsold me on a million things. And she's sure. like, you really don't need any of this sort of stuff that I do. If I could recommend one thing – you got a little frown that frown line there, just a couple of couple of shots here or there, maybe twice a year, and you're good to go. And I'm like, oh, okay. And the okay. next thing I know, she's got the needle and she's coming at me, and it's good Perfect. to go. Oh, well, congratulations on your Botox. That's Thank a nice you. little birthday treat. I've you know, you don't have very many virginities or cherries to pop as you get a bit older because you no. do so much. So that was the yeah. first time I've ever done that. Well, that's very cool. <laughs> anyway. So if your face starts drooping halfway through this <laughs> halfway through this recording, I'll know why. Yeah, well, you and I have a tendency to have strokes and things in our We episodes, do. We have so... moments. Absolutely we do. Anyway, so apart from that, Kate, let's get into this week's story, shall we? Let's do it. I'm ready. Before we do, it's not they're not part of the Boo Pod Network, but we are shouting out um your mum's a hoax podcast Yay. um they've been fans of ours for a little bit and we thought we'd 
shed a little spotlight on them to this week. We don't have their promo uh, sound bites, so sorry. You're just going to have to. Is this like a surprise one? I don't even think they're going to know because no. it wasn't until today that we we actually, and I feel bad about this, but we followed them back on socials. Um, but we were having a bit of a look through some different uh, podcasts and things that we've, you know, been looking at and everything mm-hmm. like that. So that was one that that piqued our interest. Um, so hi, yeah. Brenna. Hi, hi, Alexis. Hi, Alexis. Hi, Brenna. How are you both? <laughs> what a cool little team. But, yeah, they, they, they appear to be, yeah, again, similar to us in just telling some crackers stories and they're just fresh. So I thought, why not? Let's Let's shout out some fellow potties. Yeah, spread the love. So Absolutely. Welcome to the world of podcasting, you two. Hey. We love your show. Please, everyone listening to us, go have a listen to this. Why not? Yeah, why not? Have a bit of a peep. All right, Kate, this Hello. week's episode. I hope you are ready because this is a full-on one. <laughs> okay. Content warning, sensitivity warning for all you folks at home. We're pretty much going into the deepest, darkest bowels of hell in human history. Perfect. <laughs> Um, and funnily enough, if you've been listening to some of our previous episodes, I did a, I did one on human experiments. Mm-hmm. And last week, Kate, you did a cracker of an episode on twins. Mm-hmm. So I thought, why not combine them together? Why not? <laughs> Double the trouble. Boom. So this is the story of the angel of death, otherwise known as Yosef. Mengele. Okay, bring it on, Yosef. Which you may have, you know, heard that name previously. But Mengele uh, was born 16th of March 1911 and he died on the 7th of February 1979. He is also known as the Angel of Death and was a German Schutzstaffel or SS officer and physician during World War II. Okay. There's going to be a lot of German words in this episode. I love and it. I'm so looking forward to it. I'm very excited. I kind of wish you had done even like more work and done like the Tim Allen in Christmas with the Cranks when he just gets so much Botox. Like he can't even, like, we're going to be doing lots of German words today. <laughs> I think that would have been a perfect episode. That just reminds me of Indiana Jones and their faces <laughs> melting when they yes. crack open the old tomb. Oh, my goodness. All right, Yosef, the SS, let's go. Now, he is mainly remembered for his actions at the Auschwitz concentration camp where he performed deadly experiments on prisoners. As a member of the team of doctors who selected victims to be killed in the gas chambers and as one of the doctors who administered the gas himself. So cool guy. Yeah. Mm. With the Red Army troops sweeping through German-occupied Poland, Mengele was transferred 280 kilometres from Auschwitz to the Grossrosen concentration camp on the 17th of January 1945 just 10 days before the arrival of the Soviet forces at Auschwitz. So he just got away. Mm. Before the war, Mengele had received doctorates in anthropology and medicine and began a career as a researcher. He joined the Nazi party in 1937 and the SS in 1938. He was assigned as a battalion medical officer at the start of World War II, then transferred to the Nazi concentration camps service in early 1943 and assigned to Auschwitz. Now, there he saw the opportunity to conduct genetic research on human subjects. His experiments focused primarily on twins with no regard for their health or safety of the victims. Mm -hmm. Now, after the war, Mengele fled to Argentina in July 1949, assisted by a network of former SS members. He initially lived in and around Buenos Aires, then fled to Paraguay in 1959 and Brazil in 1960, all the while being sought by West Germany, Israel and Nazi hunters such as Simon Wiesenthal, who wanted to bring him to trial. Yeah. Now, Mengele eluded capture in spite of extradition requests by the West German government and clandestine operations by the Israeli intelligence agency Mossad. 
He ended up drowning in 1979 after suffering a stroke. Funny we mentioned strokes. Ooh. While swimming off the coast of Bertioga. Bertioga? Bertioga. Yeah, Bertioga. Sure. And was buried under the false name of Wolfgang Gerhard. His remains were disinterred and positively identified by forensic examination in 1985. Okay. Okay, folks, I've started off with a little summary so you know where we're going to go. I'm ready. You know, yeah. Yeah. I, there's some bad stuff. Yeah. We're getting Previously into the on, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just about to do like a reality intro. <laughs> um for this horrendous story i'm so sorry please continue so who is this mangala let's get down to the nitty-gritty i like that we can use now i'm going to get this wrong but mangala as like a an like an adjective yeah you know, this let's get on to this mangala yeah <laughs> it's a mangala of a story this is mangala of a story now he was born in gunsberg on the 16th of march 1911 the eldest of three sons of Wahlberger and Karl Mengele. Ooh. His two younger brothers were Karl Jr. and Eloise. Their father was founder of the Karl Mengele and Sons Company, which produced farming machinery. Now, Mengele was successful at school and developed an interest in music, art, and skiing. Okay. You know, that subject, skiing, that you do. Music, art, skiing. I mean, the last time I skied was on year 10 ski camp. So, <laughs> okay. I just love that there's those subjects. I mean, he was shit at everything else, but. <laughs> but skiing, A+. plus. Yeah. <laughs> now, he completed high school in April 1930 and went on to study philosophy in Munich, where the headquarters of the Nazi party were located. Mm, I heard they don't turn out as that good, the no. Nazi party. Not it's not so much a party, <laughs> oh. not as much of a party as you'd think. Now, he attended the University of Bonn, where he took his medical preliminary, preliminary examination. In 1931, he joined Der Stahlhelm, a pa paramilitary organization that was absorbed into the Nazi Sturmbündelung. I'm not even going to try and say that <laughs> word. I think you got it perfect. <laughs> I certainly did not. <laughs> In 1934. Um, so in 1935, Mengele earned a PhD in anthropology from the University of Munich. Okay. In January 1937, he joined the Institute for Hereditary Biology and Racial Hygiene in Frankfurt, where he worked for Ottmar Freer von Wuscher, Wuscher, a German geneticist with a particular interest in researching twins. Mm. Okay. So that's where it all started. That's where it started. From. As von Versch's assistant, Mengele focused on the genetic factors that result in a cleft lip and palate or a cleft chin. His thesis on the subject earned him a cum laude doctorate in medicine from the University of Frankfurt in 1938. So clearly very intelligent person and yeah. human here and was studying things like this legitimately i'm saying with air quotes mm -hmm. uh, before zavor yes before the whole hitler thing yeah yeah where the rules just kind of got thrown out now out of interest both of his degrees were ended up being revoked by the issuing universities in the 1960s oh mm. Now, in a letter of recommendation, von Wuschke praised Mengele's reliability and his ability to verbally present complex material in a clear manner. Now, the American author Robert J. Lifton notes that Mengele's published works were in keeping with the scientific mainstream of the time and would probably have been viewed as valid scientific efforts even outside of Nazi Germany. So what he was doing was... Like valid, like above board. Yeah. Okay. Got you. You know, he wasn't he wasn't doing anything untoward, at least from a published public type. Got you. Space. Yeah. Okay. Now, in uh, on the twenty eighth of July, nineteen thirty nine, Mengele married Irene Sean Bean. Sean Bean. Sean Bean. Sean Bean. <laughs> Sean Bean. <laughs> Poor guy. He was killed Scalding. in Game of Thrones and he was in um, James Bond. I love yeah, Sean Bean. We do. Irene. 
Sorry. Sean Bean. I Irene Sean Bean. <laughs> <laughs> so Mengele married I Irene? Yeah. Oh, gotcha. he, yeah, he met while working as a medical resident in Leipzig. Their only son, Rolf, was born in 1944. I love it. Who then went on to star in The Sound of Music. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm confusing our listeners so much right now with every reference. I'm so sorry. I think it's great. Okay. So Mengele and Irene had a son named Rolf. Yeah. Perfect. Now, his military service, let's get into a little bit of that, okay? Mm -hmm. How did he end up where he ended up? The ideology of Nazism brought together elements of anti-Semitism, racial hygiene and eugenics and combined them with pan-Germanism and territorial expansionism with the goal of obtaining more Lebsram or living space for the Germanic people. So that's a real, like, one sentence uh, yeah. of what Nazism What it was is. about, yeah. It's not great. That's all you need to take away from it, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. For those of you who aren't sure about the whole Nazi thing, um, yeah, maybe read it, read about it. Yeah, <laughs> some bad shit went down. But it's really important to understand where this medical side of things, yes, sort of infused itself into this anti-Semitic hatred and yeah. what why the Aryan race, well, why they believed the Aryan race needed more space and was under threat from X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. You yeah. know, it's... Yeah. No, it's important because especially when you mention eugenics, straight away when you're, you're talking about, um, yeah, race, eugenics, and the goal to make it, mm. you know, more room, more better life for Germanic people. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a good synopsis as to why he may have gotten involved yeah. with that. Joseph Mengele is primed candidate to yeah. just flourish in this sort of environment. And Absolutely. Sadly, he does. Now, mm. Nazi Germany attempted to obtain this new territory by attacking Poland and the Soviet Union, intending to deport or kill the Jewish peoples, however you want to refer, just I'm going to use the term Jews. They're comfortable mm -hmm. with it. I'm comfortable with it. Yep. And the Slavs living there. So not just Jewish people. And, and if you don't know who Slavs are, please go read up, read up about it. Now, they were considered by the Nazis to be inferior to the Aryan master race. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Mengele joined the Nazi party in 1937 and the Schutzstaffel SS Protection Squad in 1938. He received basic training in the same year with the Griebigsjager Light Infantry Mountain Troop and was called up for service in the Wehrmacht Nazi Armed Forces in 1940. I'm so, really enjoying the effort that you're putting into the, I think it's when you put the that like like emphasis yeah. in it. Yeah, you, you're making it. It's I'm loving it. I'm probably butchering it still, but it is a Doesn't beautiful matter, language cool. and I love using it. Awesome. And it's the only thing that's going to get me through this story without cringing. <laughs> okay. Um, some months after the outbreak of World... That's when... So he joined just a few months after World War II broke out. Mm -hmm. Now, he soon volunteered for medical service in the Waffen-SS, the combat arm of the SS, where he served with the rank of SS Unterstromfuhr, second lieutenant in a medical reserve battalion uh, until November 1940. He was next assigned to the SS Ras und, I can't even, not going to try it, um, which is a race and settlement main office in Poznan, evaluating candidates for Germanization. Right. So, you know, it didn't take long for him to get to where he was probably of most use. Mm, that's right. At least what they considered. Yeah. In June 1941, Mengele was posted to Ukraine where he was awarded the Iron Cross second class. In January 1942, he joined the 5th SS Panzer Division Viking as a battalion medical officer. And after rescuing two German soldiers from a burning tank, he was decorated with the Iron Cross first class. He also received the wound badge in black and the medal of the care of the German people. So he was injured in this. In this rescue. In this rescue. Yeah. Okay, got you. Okay, so he's pretty decorated as well. Very decorated, yes. Right, okay. 
Now, he was declared unfit for further active service in mid-1942. Right. <sighs> so, World War II has started. He's been quite active, gotten around the spot. He's been in the SS, done lots of great things. Yeah. With, you know. Of course, relating to that, you know, whatever. heroism and whatnot. He's gone in and rescued a couple of guys from a burning tank. Yeah. He's hurt himself, discharged. And- now he is, yeah, unfit for service. Mm-hmm. Now, that was in 1942. Um, following his recovery, he was transferred to the headquarters of the SS Race and Settlement Main Office in Berlin, at which point he resumed his association with von Verscher. If you remember, okay. he the was... The original doctor? Yeah. Awesome. Who was he was now the director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Anthropology, Human Hereditary, and Eugenics. All right. And Mengele was promoted to the rank of SS Habstumfreur or Captain in April 1943. Right. So he wasn't discharged, he was just moved. Like he couldn't yeah. fight in the field anymore. So they've That's just popped right. him into an office. Gotcha. Now we made our way to Auschwitz. That's where the guts of this story is really getting to. Okay. In 1942, Auschwitz or Birkenau is another name you may have heard it called, Mm -hmm. originally intended to house slave labourers, began to be used instead as a combined labour camp and extermination camp. Prisoners were transported there by rail from all over Nazi-controlled Europe, arriving in daily convoys. By July 1942, SS doctors were conducting selections where incoming Jews were segregated and those considered able to work were admitted into the camp, while those who who were deemed unfit for labour were immediately killed in the gas chambers. Our man, Mengele, was highly involved in all of this. Mm-hmm. The arrivals that were selected to die, about three quarters of the total, just an Jesus. FYI, included almost all children, women with small children, pregnant women, all of the elderly, and all of those who appeared in a brief and superficial inspection by an SS doctor <laughs> to be not completely fit and healthy. Right. Yeah. There you go. Mm. What a selection. Just going to get the facts out. I love it. You know, you you know about it, obviously, you know, you're taught about it, you read about it, you watch it, all of that sort of stuff. But just every single time I hear it, I'm just still just still bl- blown away by it. It's, it's just, it's it'll never stop being horrendous, yeah. no matter how many times and how much information I have about it. And if I hear the same thing over and over, I'll react the same way every time. It's mm-hmm. just, yeah, it is. It's unfathomable. In early 1943, von Verscher encouraged Mengele to apply for a transfer to the concentration camp. Mengele's application was accepted and he was posted to Auschwitz, where he was appointed by SS Standard Start uh, Eduard Wirth, who was the chief medical officer at Auschwitz, to the position of chief physician. Now, he was going to be the chief physician of the Romani uh, family camp. So there was camps within Auschwitz. Right. A subcamp which was located on the main Auschwitz complex. The SS doctors did not administer treatment to the Auschwitz inmates but supervised the activities of inmate doctors who had been forced to work in the camp medical service. As part of his duties, Mengele made weekly visits to the hospital barracks and ordered any prisoners who had not recovered after two weeks in bed to be sent to the gas chambers. So he's not actually doing any physician work. All of right. he's doing is managing the inmates yep. who have doctor training. Yes. And pretty much just going, not recovered, not recovered, get out, you got. Yep. So wow. hardly using his medical knowledge to the benefit of the people that he's enslaving, right? Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Now, Mengele's work also involved carrying out selections, a task that he chose to perform even when he was not assigned to do so, in the hope of finding subjects for his experiments with a particular interest in locating sets of twins. Now, in contrast to most of the other SS doctors who viewed selections as one of their most stressful and unpleasant duties, 
He undertook the task with a flamboyant air, often smiling or whistling. That's Ugh. not that's not all right. Ugh. He was one of the SS doctors responsible for supervising the administration of Zyklon B, the cyanide-based pesticide that was used for the mass killings in the Birkenau gas, gas chambers. He served in this capacity at the gas chambers located in crematoria four and five. Now, when an outbreak of Noma, a gangrenous bacterial disease of the mouth and face, struck the Romani camp in 1943, Mengele initiated a study to determine the cause of the disease and develop a treatment. He enlisted the assistance of prisoner Berthold Epstein, a Jewish paediatrician and professor at Prague University. The patients were isolated in separate barracks and several afflicted children were killed so their preserved heads and organs could be sent to the SS Medical Academy in Graz and other facilities for study. This research was still ongoing when the Romani camp was liquidated and its remaining occupants killed in 1944. Now, when a typhus epidemic began in the women's camp, Mengele cleared one block of 600 Jewish women and sent them to their deaths in the gas chambers. The building was then cleaned and disinfected and the occupants of a neighbouring block were bathed, deloused and given new clothing before being moved into the clean block. This whole process of wiping out a whole block cleaning it and repopulating. This process was repeated until all of the barracks were disinfected. Similar procedures were used for later epidemics of scarlet fever and other diseases, with infected prisoners being killed just in the gas chambers. So they just go, okay, you guys are sick. Let's put all the sickies into one block and then we'll make sure you're all super duper sick. Mm -hmm. And now you guys can all go for a wander down to the gas chambers. We'll disinfect and put freshies in here. That aren't unwell. Yeah. So the level of care here, oh. or the guise of being doctors and treating people, is just absolutely it doesn't. Yeah, they're not to bullshit. Yeah, they're not treating people. They're just keeping the healthy ones alive. Mm -hmm. That's it. Far out. Now, Oof. for these actions, Mengele was awarded the War Merit Cross, second class with swords, and was promoted in 1944 to first physician of the Birkenau subcamp. Cool. He's just getting started. He's just getting promoted left, right, and centre for just really lazily killing hundreds yeah. and probably thousands of people. Oh, fucking hell. Now, it gets worse. Mengele used Auschwitz as an opportunity to continue his anthropological studies and research into hereditary, using inmates for human experimentation. His medical procedures showed no consideration for the victim's health, safety, or physical or emotional suffering. No shit. No <laughs> shit. He was particularly interested in, in identical twins, people with het het heterochromia, iridium, which is eyes of two different colours. Mm -hmm. They say dwarfs. I'm not going to, we're not going to use the, continue to use the word dwarfs. We're going to say little people. Mm -hmm. Or as we should say, yes, little people and people with physical abnormalities. <clears throat> A grant was provided by the Deutsch. Kate, there's literally 26 letters in this <laughs> word. So I'm going to have to give it a go. go. Please do. Deutsch Forschungsmenschaft. Yeah. I think German that's right. Research Foundation. Yeah. At the request of von Verscher, who received regular reports and shipments of specimens from Mengele. The grant was used to build a pathology laboratory attached to crematorium 2 at Auschwitz um, and Miklos Nizili, a Hungarian Jewish pathologist who arrived in Auschwitz on May 29th, 1944, he performed dissections and prepared specimens for shipment in this laboratory. 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 Yeah. What have you, you like? say? Do you say laboratory or laboratory? I would probably say laboratory. Laboratory? Laboratory? Laboratory. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, now I'm thinking, thinking about it too much. Thinking about it too much. Yeah. Now, the twin research was in part intended to prove the supremacy of hereditary her heredity 
over the environment in, deter in determining phenotypes and thus strengthen the Nazi premise of the genetic superiority of the Aryan race. Okay. Nazili. So, yeah, similar to the one from last week's episode where is it, you know, how you're raised or is it your DNA that shapes exactly. who you are? Now, Nazili, the um, pathologist that came to work in the, in the laboratory, mm -hmm. and others reported that the twin studies may also have been motivated by an intention to uncover strategies for racially desirable Germans to reproduce more twins. Okay. So they wanted to encourage... We want more. More twins. Yeah. Now, Mengele's research subjects were better fed and housed than the other prisoners and temporarily spared from execution in the gas chambers. I'm not trying to put this out as a they had it better. Mm -hmm. It's just factually they were fed and housed mm. in more comfortable I sure. still wouldn't say they're comfortable at all. No. And it's just a matter of time, really. Exactly. Because once they're done with their experiments, then they're just like, off to the chamber with you. Yeah. Bye. Now, his research subjects lived in their own barracks where they were provided with a marginally better quality of food and somewhat improved living conditions other than the other than uh, conditions than the other areas of camp. Mm -hmm. Now, when visiting his young subjects, he introduced himself as Uncle Mangala. Gross. And offered them sweets while at the same time being personally responsible for the deaths of an unknown number of victims who he killed via lethal injection, sometimes as shootings, sometimes beatings, Ugh. and just overall, you know, death by the experiments themselves. So it's just whatever he felt like at the time. It's like, I'm too tired for a beating. Someone give me a gun. Yep. What a fucking psycho. Now, in 1986, the book, uh, a book, Lifton describes Mengele as sadistic, lacking mm. empathy, and extremely yep. anti-Semitic, believing the Jews should be eliminated as an inferior and dangerous race. Now, Rolf, the son, Mengele, later claimed that his father had shown absolutely no remorse for his wartime activities. Mm. A former Auschwitz inmate doctor said of Mengele, he was capable of being so kind to the children, to have them become fond of him even, to bring them sugar and to think of small details in their daily lives and to do things we would genuinely admire. And then next to that, the crematoria smoke and these children tomorrow or in half an hour, he's going to send them there. Well, that is where the anomaly lay. <sighs> yeah, he's a true psycho yeah you can't deny that now twins were subjected subjected to weekly examinations and measurements of their physical attributes by Mengele or one of his assistants the experiments he performed on twins included unnecessary amputation of limbs intentionally infecting one twin with typhus or some other disease and transfusing the blood of one twin into the other Jesus so many yeah Many of the victims died while undergoing these procedures and those who survived the experiments were sometimes killed and their bodies dissected. Nazili recalled one occasion on which Mengele personally killed 14 twins in one night by injecting their hearts with chloroform. Yeah, yeah, that'd do it. That's a cure for life, that. Yep. If one God. twin died from disease, he would kill the other twin to allow comparative post-mortem reports to be produced for research purposes. Mengele's he, eye He's not very nice. No. <laughs> That's what we're gathering, yeah. We're Holy almost shit. past the worst of it. No, I'm. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. As morbid and as horrendous as it is, I still do find it fascinating because this stuff, you have to, you know, talk about it and understand it because it shapes you know, a lot of what happens in the world today, everything does. History shapes the future. So it's fascinating to hear about these things that happened and people that witnessed it and mm. were able to talk about it after and say this guy, like, gave these kids a lolly and then chucked them in a gas chamber. Like, that's properly psychotic. Yeah. And I don't go too much of it into this story, but I, maybe I'll pause just quickly now. There mm. is... I think a lot of people don't understand that there is still today 
a very large group of people that think all of this is bullshit, that mm -hmm. all of this is made up, that this never happened. Mm -hmm. And to your point, Kate, we can't just ignore it. Yeah. We not we don't need to revel in the details. That's no. not what you and I are doing. But we can't just fob this off and not educate ourselves and learn what actually happened because the reason we have such detail of all of these things is because that there were people that were there. Yes. That did survive and have, you know, this what happened to them was burned into their memory for life. Yep. And you and I are of a generation where people who did survive and were there you know, I don't, there's not many of those survivors left mm. <clears throat> and there's going to come a time when there are no living survivors and we've got to, we've got to remember this sort of stuff. So absolutely. And this is, you know, there's lots of horrible things out of this whole entire period of time, but we're just focusing on this one person and, and what he did. <clears throat> Now, Mengele's eye experiments included attempts to change the eye colour by injecting chemicals into the eyes of living subjects. Oh, my God. And he killed people with heterochromatic eyes so that, that the eyes could be removed and sent to Berlin for study. His <sighs> experiments on little people and people with physical abnormalities included taking physical measurements, drawing blood, extracting healthy teeth, and treatment with unnecessary drugs and x-rays. Many of his victims were dispatched to the gas chambers after about two weeks and their skeletons were sent to Berlin for further analysis. Mengele sought out pregnant women on whom he would perform experiments before sending them to the gas chambers. Alex Deckel, a survivor, reports witnessing Mengele performing vivisection without anesthesia, removing hearts and stomachs of victims. What? You're supposed to, they're supposed to be under anesthesia, I'm sure of it. I'm no doctor, but I know that much. Yeah. I think, and we might do, a, I know you were going to talk about maybe doing a story on that topic uh -huh. um, in the future, but yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, waking up during surgery or being conscious during surgery. surgery yeah. yeah. Uh, someone else, Yitzhak Gannon, another survivor, reported in 2009 how Mengele removed his kidney without anesthesia. Oh. He, was he was forced to return to work without painkillers. <laughs> Off another you go. witness. <laughs> Off you go to work. Go and lug some rocks, please, Dal. You'll be fine. Just, yeah. you know, don't pop Walk a stitch. Off. You probably didn't even get stitches. They probably just used a stapler or a, poke, a hot poker or something. Oof. Jesus. Another witness, Vera Alexander, described how Mengele sewed two Romani twins together back to back in a crude attempt to create conjoined twins. Why? <sighs> what? Oh, Christ. Why? Just, I don't understand. Just for shits and giggles. Oof. Just to see. Now, both children would later die of gangrene after several days of suffering. Shock. That's a real shock that you just try and stitch two humans together and it didn't work out and they died from infection. What an absolute fucking stain. Yeah. What a piece of shit. Absolute oh, shit yeah. bag. He is a shit bag. Yeah. Shit bag. <clears throat> All right. Let's move on from the, you know, the rather difficult details sure. of what happened at Auschwitz after Auschwitz. Now, along with several other Auschwitz doctors, Mengele transferred to Gross Rosen concentration camp in Lower Silesia on 17th of January 1945, taking with him two boxes of specimens and the records of his experiments at Auschwitz. Now, most of the camp medical records had already been destroyed by the SS by the time the Red Army liberated Auschwitz on the 27th of January. Mengele fled Grossrosen on 18th of February, a week before the Soviets arrived there. Oh, and what traveled... a slippery shitbag. I know. What Keeps a piece getting of away. Shit. And he traveled westward to Zatek in Czechoslovakia, disguised as a Wehrmacht officer. Okay. There, he temporarily entrusted his incriminating documents to a nurse with whom he had struck up a relationship. He and his unit then hurried west to avoid being captured by the Soviets, but were taken prisoners of war by the Americans in June 1945. 
So he actually was captured. Okay, good. Although Mengele was initially registered under his own name, he was not identified as being on the major war criminal list due to the disorganisation of the Allies regarding the distribution of wanted lists. <sighs> and the fact that he did not have the usual SS blood group tattoo. Right, okay. He was released at the end of July and obtained false papers under the name of Fritz Ullmann, documents he later altered to read Fritz Holman. Okay. I mean, granted, you can't really, you know, that that criminals of war list was probably, you know, as big as the bloody Da Vinci Code. So you can't really fault them for not having a name on the list and just following their their procedures at the time. I can only imagine how fast that would have happened and how difficult it would have been to get all of the names of all of the shit bags that were involved. Yeah, because you have to understand, folks, that people didn't know everything that was going on. Yeah, not at that it's, point. No, to the, the the level of detail and the depths of horror that was occurring yeah. was one of a million other things going on at the time during a very intense war. It's mm. just, you know. Now, after several months on the run, including a trip back to the Soviet-occupied area to recover his Auschwitz reports, Mengele found work near Rosenheim as a farmhand. He eventually escaped from Germany on the 17th of April 1949, convinced that his capture would mean a trial and a death sentence. Yeah, I think so. I'm glad you put that together, you <laughs> douchebag. <laughs> absolute piece of garbage oh i reckon they might not love what i was doing yeah. especially if they find my documents i don't know if they're going to be really thrilled so i might get punished for this what a piece yeah. of shit now assisted by a network of former ss members he used the rat line to travel to genoa where he obtained a passport from the international community committee of the red cross under the alias helmet gregor and sailed to Argentina in July 1949. His wife, however, refused to accompany him and they divorced in 1954. Was his wife the nurse that he trusted with the documents? No, that was, oh. she, she was someone on the side, oh. Irene Sean Bean. Oh, that's right, Irene Sean Bean, of course. <laughs> okay, so life in South America. Now, Mengele worked as a carpenter in Buenos Aires, Argentina, while lodging in a boarding house in the suburb of Vicente Lopez. After a few weeks, he moved to, a ha to the house of a Nazi sympathiser in the more affluent neighbourhood of Florida Este. He next worked as a salesman for his family's farm equipment company, Carl Mengele and Sons. Okay. And in 1951, he began making frequent trips to Paraguay as a regional sales representative. Mm. He moved into an apartment in central Buenos Aires in 1953. He used family funds to buy a part interest in a carpentry concern and then rented a house in the suburbs of Olivos in 1954. Now, files released by the Argentine government in 1992 indicate that Mengele may have practiced medicine without a license while living in Buenos Aires, including and not limited to performing abortions. This doesn't surprise me because I was just thinking that whole time you were just like, he worked it as a farmhand and then he was a chippy and then he's a salesman. I'm like, he's 100% doing some dodgy medical shit on yeah. the side. So that doesn't, it doesn't shock me. Yeah. I, uh... I can't imagine those abortions were super comfy. No. Now... After obtaining a copy of his birth certificate through the West German Embassy in 1956, Mengele was issued with an Argentine foreign residence permit under his real name. Okay. He used this document to obtain a West German passport using his real name and embarked on a trip to Europe. The fucking gall what, of this dude. Why? How's the big steel balls on this fellow? Hmm. Oh, he's gross. Now, he met with his son, Ralph, who was told Mengele was his uncle Fritz mm. and his widowed sister-in-law, Martha, for a ski holiday in Switzerland. Oh, well, he did get A-pluses in skiing, so. Yeah. 
Now, he also spent a week in his hometown of Gunsberg. So he's just he was he's, able to return and just get away. He's got a passport. It's in his name. He's just gone home. Like, it's clear that he was never on any kind of list. Mm -hmm. Now, when he returned to Argentina in September 1956, Mengele began living under his real name. Martha and her son, Karl Heinz, followed about a month later and the three began living together, his sister-in-law, Martha. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Josef and Martha were married in 1958 while on holiday in Uruguay and they bought a house in Buenos Aires. He married his sister-in-law? Yep. Oh, okay. Mm. Goodness me. Now, Mengele's business interests now included part ownership of a Fadro farm, a pharmaceutical company. Along with several other doctors, he was questioned in 1958 on suspicion of practicing medicine without a license. And when a teenage girl died after an abortion, oh. but he was released without Happy. charge. Yeah, why would you charge him? He's doing he's a doctor, doing good for the community. Mm. <laughs> Now, aware that the publicity could lead to his Nazi background and wartime activities being discovered, he took an extended business trip to Paraguay and was granted citizenship there in 1959 under the name of Jose Mengele. Who are giving, who's giving all of these people just all these citizenships? Stop it. Yeah, that part of the world at the time was... Oh, yeah, recovering. Lucy goosey and yeah. lots of stuff going now. And I'm sure there were lots of good people that needed places to live and citizenship and everything Absolutely. like that, for sure. But it didn't stop, yeah, these slimy fuckers slipping through the cracks. Taking advantage, absolutely. Uh -huh. Now, he returned to Buenos Aires several times to settle his business affairs and visit his family. Martha and Carl lived in a boarding house in the city until December 1960 when they returned to West Germany. So clearly that marriage was not going so great either. <laughs> I can't imagine he was a trait to live with. Mm. Now, Mengele's name was mentioned several times during the Nuremberg trials in the mid-1940s, but the Allied forces believed that he was probably already dead. Oh, Jesus Christ. Now, Irene Mengele and the family in Gunsberg also alleged that he had died. So they're just lying, outright okay. lying. They knew he was alive. Yeah. Now, working in West Germany, Nazi hunters Simon Wiesenthal and Hermann Langbein collected information from witnesses about Mengele's wartime activities. You need to read up about this Simon Wiesenthal. He's probably the most well-known Nazi hunter. But this motherfucking legend was in a concentration camp. He survived. And not oh, only God. did he survive... Within three fucking weeks of getting out, he was immediately on the hunt. He was on it. For these people. Oh. Like, no joke, Terminator has got nothing on Simon. Yeah. What's his surname again? Weisenthal. Okay. W-I-E-S-E-N-T-H-A-L. All right. I'm going to get a book. Not Let right this second, but yeah. Yeah, let me finish, Kate. Oh, <laughs> rude. Um, now, in a search of the public records, Langbein discovered Mengele's divorce papers, which listed an address in Buenos Aires. Perfect. He Get and signed. Weissenthal pressured the West German authorities into starting extradition proceedings and an arrest warrant was drawn up on the 5th of June, 1959. Woo! So Nuremberg happened in the mid 40s we're yeah. talking like let's round it up to 15 years later they're like oh okay maybe you know maybe should check this out oh shit it's right the there thing. in the fucking divorce papers yeah Ugh. argentina initially refused the extradition request because the fugitive was no longer living at the address given on the documents oh it doesn't matter and by the time the extradition was approved on the 30th of June, Mengele had already fled to Paraguay and was living on a farm near the Argentine border. Of course. Jose's out of there. Peace out. Peace. Now, Mossad was also after Mengele at the same time around. Now, in May 1960, Issa Harrell, director of the Israeli intelligence agency Mossad, personally led the successful effort to capture Adolf Eichmann in Buenos Aires another escapee. Excellent. 
He was hoping to track down Mengele so that he too could be brought to trial in Israel. Now, under interrogation, Eichmann provided the address of a boarding house that had been used as a safe house for Nazi fugitives. Surveillance of the house did not reveal Mengele or any members of his family, and the neighbourhood postman claimed that although Mengele had recently been receiving letters there under his real name, he had since relocated without leaving a forwarding address. Harrell's inquiries at a, at a machine shop where Mengele had been part owner also failed to generate any leads, so he was forced to abandon the search. No. This Mengele has got some... Oh, fucking... he's slippy-dippy. Yeah. Now, despite having provided Mengele with legal documents using his real name in 1956, which had enabled him to formalise his permanent residency in Argentina, West Germany was now offering a reward for his capture. Good. Continuing newspaper coverage of his wartime activities with accompanying photographs led the fugitive to relocate once again in 1960. Now, former pilot Hans Ulrich Rudel put him in touch with the Nazi supporter Wolfgang Gerhard, who helped Mengele to cross the border to, into Brazil. He stayed with Gerhard on his farm near Sao Paulo until more permanent accommodation could be found, which came about when Hungarian expatriates Giza and Gitta Stammer. Now, the couple bought a farm in Nova Europa with the help of an investment from Mengele, who was given the job of managing for them. The three bought a coffee and cattle farm in Serra Negra in 1962, with Mengele owning ha a half interest. Like, this dude's just not he's only getting away, he's just yeah. like, oh, new business. Sweet. He's just thriving. Like, he's just buying new stuff. He's obviously got money. If he's owning half shares in businesses and whatnot, he's obviously got a bit of coin. Yep. Bonkers. Now, the three bought a coffee. Yeah, I said that one. Now, Gerhard had initially told the Stammers that the fugitive's name was Peter Hochbichler. <laughs> yeah. Peter Hochbichler. Yeah. But they discovered his true identity in 1963. Now, Gerhard persuaded the couple not to report Mengele's location to the authorities by convincing them that they themselves could be implicated for harbouring a fugitive. Oh. In February 61, West Germany widened its extradition request to include Brazil, having been tipped off to the possibility that Mengele had re relocated there. Now, meanwhile, Zvi Aharani, one of the Mossad agents who had been involved in the Eichmann capture, was placed in charge of a team of agents tasked with tracking down Mengele and bringing him to trial in Israel. Yay! Now, the inquiries in Paraguay revealed no clues to his whereabouts and they were unable to intercept any correspondence between Mengele and his wife, Martha, who by this time was living in Italy. Agents who were following Rudel's movements also failed to produce any leads. So Harani and his team followed Gerhard to a rural area near Sao Paulo where they identified a European man who they believed to be Mengele. This potential breakthrough was, was reported to Haral, but the logistics of staging a capture, the budgetary constraints of the search operation, and the priority of focusing on Israel's deteriorating relationship with Egypt led the Mossad chief to call off the manhunt in oh. 1962. No, I'll, I will pay for it. I've got at least so close. $150 I could scrounge up. <laughs> I will put that towards it and I'll happily make sandwiches for all the Mossad boys, pack them a nice little lunch, Go on your little adventure. Go get, get this, this absolute yeah. piece of shit. Okay, 1969. <clears throat> Mengele and the Stammers, you know, the ones who bought yeah. the coffee. Geezer and Gertie, yeah. Yeah. Jointly purchased a farmhouse in Carreras with Mengele Stop as the owner. up all the shit. This is crazy. Mm -hmm. Who's letting him sign all these mortgage papers? Oh. Free reign. Now, when Wolfgang Gerhard returned to Germany in 71 to seek medical treatment for his ailing wife and son, he gave his identity card to Mengele. Mm -hmm. Now, the Stammers' friendship with Mengele deteriorated in 1974, and when they bought a house in Sao Paulo, he was not invited to yeah. join them. You can't come. You're an absolute crackers, psychopath. You're probably not a great person to be around. Get out of yeah. our lives. 
a couple of times I've woken up in the morning with a scar <laughs> around my belly and I'm... I'm feeling a bit sus. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you stitch me and my sister together? <laughs> We're going to go. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Now, the Stammers later bought a bungalow in the El Dorado neighbourhood of Diadema, Sao Paulo, which they rented out to Mengele. So they're like, you just go stay over there. Oh, uh, okay. So, yeah. All right. Now, Ralph, who had not seen his father since the ski holiday in 1956, mm -hmm. visited him at the bungalow in 1977. He found an unrepentant Nazi, as he describes, mm. who claimed who who had claimed to never have personally harmed anyone and had only carried out his duties as an officer. Bullshit. Yes. Mengele's health had been steadily deteriorating since Good. 1972. He suffered a stroke in 1976, experienced high blood pressure and developed an ear infection which affected his balance. Oh, Paul did Oh, shit. Sorry. Sorry, you got a bit of an ear bug there, Dal. Make sure you put your grommets in when you go for a swim, mm. you fucking idiot. Now, on the 7th of February 1979, while visiting his friends Wolfram and Lissolette Bossert in the coastal resort of Bertioga, Mengele suffered another stroke while swimming and drowned. Good. His body was buried in Embu da Sartes under the name of Wolfgang Gerhard. Remember Gerhard giving given his... The ID. identity card. Mm -hmm. <sighs> and he'd been using that since 1971. Now, other aliases used by Mengele in his later life included Dr. Fausto Rudon and S. Jose Alves Asperezo. Aspiazu. Okay, exhumation. Ugh. Now, meanwhile, sightings of Mengele were being reported all over the world. Weisenthal claimed to have information that placed Mengele on the Greek island of Kathinos in 1960, in Cairo in 61, in Spain in 71, in Paraguay in 78, which was 18 years after he had left the country. Jesus. Now, he insisted as late as 1985 that Mengele was still alive six years after he had died, having previously offered a reward of 100 US dollars which is equivalent to about 300,000 okay. for the fugitive's capture. Now, worldwide interest in the case was heightened by a mock trial held in Jerusalem in February 1985, featuring the testimonies of over 100 victims of Mengele's experiments. Now, shortly afterwards, the West German, Israeli and US governments launched a coordinated effort to determine Mengele's whereabouts. Finally, getting this Yeah, shit exactly. Go and get him. The West German and Israeli governments offered rewards for his capture, as did the Washington Times and the Simon Weisenthal Center. Now, on the 31st of May 1985, acting on intelligence received by the West German Prosecutor's Office, police raided the house of Hans Sedlemir, a lifelong friend of Mengele and sales manager of the family firm in Guzberg. They found a coded address book and copies of letters sent to and received from Mengele. Among the papers was a letter from Wolfram Bosser notifying Sittelheim that of Mengele's death. So German authorities alerted the police in Sao Paulo, who then contacted the Bosserts. Under interrogation, they revealed the location of Mengele's grave and the remains were exhumed on the 6th of June 1985. Extensive forensic examination indicated with a high degree of probability that the body was indeed that of Josef Mengele. Rolf Mengele issued a statement on the 10th of June confirming that the body was his father's and he admitted that the news of his father's death had been concealed in order pr to protect the people who had sheltered him for many years. Oh, why? Why protect them? Now, in 1992, DNA testing confirmed Mengele's identity beyond doubt. Good. But family members refused repeated requests by Brazilian officials to repatriate the remains to Germany. The skeleton is stored at the Sao Paulo Institute for Forensic Medicine, where it is used as an educational aid during forensic medicine courses at the University of Sao Paulo's medical school. I don't like that. I think that's just... Actually, yeah. uh, you should crush them all up and just throw them in the bin. Mm. I, I don't like that. 
but you know if providing the medicines used for good true that's the main thing almost done kate now in 2007 the united states holocaust memorial museum received as a donation the hocker album an album of photographs of auschwitz staff taken by carl friedrich hocker eight of the photographs include mengele Ooh. Now, in February 2010, a 180-page volume of Mengele's diary was sold by Alexander Autographs at auction for an undisclosed sum to the grandson of a Holocaust survivor. Oh, okay. The unidentified previous owner who acquired the journals in Brazil was reported to be close to the Mengele family. A Holocaust survivor's organisation described the sale as a cynical act of exploitation aimed at profiting from the writings of one of the most heinous Nazi criminals. Mm. Rabbi Marvin Eyre Eyre, of the Simon Weisenhall Centre was glad to see the diary fall into Jewish hands at a time when, I can't say it, I ran regularly, ah, okay, at a time when Ahmed Inajed's Iran regularly denies the Holocaust and anti-Semitism and hatred of Jews is back in vogue, this mm. acquisition is especially significant, he said. In 2011, a further 31 volumes of Mengele's diaries were sold, again amidst protests, by the same auction house to an undisclosed collector of World War II memorabilia for two hundred and forty-five thousand US dollars. For all of them? Yeah. Okay. How would you? That's a that's a good question, actually. If you were, if something like that came up for auction, because that's fascinating. Let you got to give it that. Like that would mm. be fascinating to have to own. Uh, would you? Would you buy it? Would you bid on it? Would you? Would it be something if you would, you know, what would be the reason behind you wanting it in your possession, knowing that you're potentially giving that money to someone who, you know, protected him and harboured him? I think the importance of that work so it can be unequivocally protected that he did what he did. Yes. I think the money is irrelevant That's like, worth it. and who yeah. it goes to. I yeah. think the risk of all of this being swept away yeah. and what not just Jewish people, people all over the world in very yeah. many different circumstances, evidence has been denied or destroyed or whatever, like we can't ever forget this sort of stuff. Yeah. Obviously, I feel icky about it going, someone profiting from this yeah. sort of crap. But, but you know what? But money doesn't last forever. Like, they can't take money with them. But yeah. they can destroy evidence like this, which can change the course of history. Yeah. Fascinating. Here's another so, question for you before you go. Mm-hmm. He changed his names a lot, and that got me thinking. If you ever, like, went to check into a hotel or something, you were going to pick another name, what would you pick? So I've got three that I would go with. because. Go so I like names of, you know, like female characters from other, like a, there, there's two from, there's one from a TV show, one from a movie and one from a book. Um, so I would either be Irene Kennedy, who is from a series of books written by Vince Flynn, um, the Mitch Rapp series. I would be um, Sydney Wade, um, who is from The American President. It's played mm-hmm. by Annette Benning. Um, or I would be Claudia Jean um, oh. from the West Wing because I think that those names are, like, subtle enough or co- common in a sense that no one would pick up that it was a fake name, but yep. they also like names that I like for their references to things that I enjoy. I think I would, I don't have any on off the cuff, but I think I would go for something that is super relatable and i would need to be able to create a character around it for yeah. me because yeah you know so i would probably stick with something that is italian or whatever so yeah. i feel like there's still a cultural connection to the name and i would yeah. be easy it'd be easy for me to just roll off the tongue or whatever for sure um but if i was just picking a name for like <laughs> that was like a movie or something like that 
uh, I don't know, it'd be silly, it'd be like John Connor or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. John yeah. Connor. Sorry, yeah. I probably could have saved that for our little socials. Maybe I'll do it for that as well. But I just <laughs> got not? me thinking. I'm like, he had so many aliases. Thank you so much for telling that story, Dom. I cut you off so many times towards the end. It's all good. Look, it's a it's I didn't want to get into too much of the really graphic details, but you know, it's a huge story. It's the angel of death. Like yeah. this, and it, it ties a lot of our previous episodes together. So I'd love maybe it. not as dark and confronting as we thought, but I think just the subject matter itself is is very confronting. So. Oh, for sure. And it always brings up debate and mm. questioning and realization of just atrocities that have existed in our world. So have you got a story for us next week, Kate? I do. Oh, mama. I'm telling you a story next week. So I told the story of the Cecil Hotel a little yes. while ago and the mysterious disappearances and uh, things like that. But there's another motel that's very famous and it's in the United States. It's in Nevada and it's called the Clown Motel. Oh, and it has a story and it's still open today and it is what you would think. It's horrendous. So I'm going to tell you all about that and, yeah, come and, come and have a listen about the Clown Motel. I love this. Two weeks in a row now we're combining themes we from are. episodes to give you double whammies, folks. So well, I think every time we do these stories we read things and, like, oh, I'd love to do an episode on that. We've mm. got to do an episode on that. So I think I'm just trying to make sure I don't forget what those stories were when I was reading them. So I'm trying to do them sooner rather than later because my list is growing. So I'm just trying to smash them out. Thanks so much for tuning in, Kate. And for everyone at home, please do go look at our socials. Please go visit our Patreon. We Yay. really appreciate any support you can give us. It goes a really long way. Just a couple of bucks, please. Absolutely. Love you. love you guys so much. And we'll see you next week. Happy birthday, Dominique. Bye. Botox boy. <laughs> <laughs>